that you could join us this afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Holtz, and welcome to Holtz Fine Art. Um, this is our fourth annual exhibition of Texas Emerging, and we're so honored to have five of the six incredible artists we're featuring this year here today. Um, the show is co-curated by curator artist Jonathan Paul Jackson, and he will be leading a panel discussion with everyone today. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Oh, thanks everyone for coming out. It's a good crowd this year. Um, so I guess let's just start with everyone going down the road, say your name, and after that we'll just start with the questions. I'm Rachel Cavinos. I do the textile work. Hi, I'm Colleen Blackard. I do the monotypes in the middle room. I'm Kate Mulholland. I do the geology-based uh, 2D work. My name is Brendan Flores. Uh, I'm a sculpture artist that works primarily in wood, and I make cubes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patrick Renner. Uh, I also work in wood uh, with the found material that's up front. Awesome. Um, again, I'm Jonathan Jackson. Artist here at Foltz, uh, co curator. And uh, yeah, um, this group of artists, as every year, have a very in tune, I guess, communication and I guess their fingers into the community very well, um, which is a big part of like why we choose these artists every year. Um, so I guess, with that being said, we'll start with Patrick. Um, You've always gravitated towards using found objects slash what in your works. Um, what were you doing before that? Uh, oh, great question. Uh, I don't know. I guess like you know, I tried a lot of different things, and uh, I think because of uh, initially happening on a pile of wood that had some colored pieces in it, and realizing that that material was everywhere in Houston, because of the ubiquity of teardowns, renovations. Uh, it was like a light bulb moment where um, I started to, to to see that there was you know an almost unlimited palette of material also that's changing all the time, um, and so I don't remember what I was doing before that, but <laughs> when I when I found that material, that was like I was like oh this makes sense to me now you know yeah. and I started collecting that stuff and now I have way too much of it and yet I'm still <laughs> collecting more of it. So, um, What's up? Yeah. Uh, you like so like you were saying you incorporate you literally incorporate the community around you into your work um how do you feel that helps has, has you feel like that's encouraged your practice like you yeah. obviously enjoy it right yeah, yeah for sure i mean uh so i was thinking about this ahead of time and i had kind of a a revelation for myself which was actually because of the found material two i guess two things came up one is that the found material is sort of like a, an anonymous collaboration already, right? Because it's coming from other sources. Other people have painted the material or touched it when they're tearing down the building or whatever that looks like. So there's like this anonymous uh, collaborative aspect that I like a lot that I'm like endlessly kind of drawn to. But also then uh, back in 2013, when I had my first opportunity to do uh, a public artwork, I was gonna use all this found material and what I'm alluding to is the funnel tunnel for anybody that may have seen that work. Uh, because it was 180 feet, I realized quickly that as much of the stuff that I had collected, um, that wasn't gonna be enough to clad the sculpture. And so in trying to figure out how to solve that, it, the idea came up to invite people to paint the material. And that was like, that ended up being the most rewarding part of that entire process was like getting to meet people and their excitement and them putting their mark on the, the work instead of it just being about you know my decision making so what's cool about that project for me and subsequent projects is I didn't paint one stick of wood in that entire thing I, I prepared it all so I spent like I kid you not like 10 hours on a table saw ripping down boards <laughs> to make enough stuff that people could you know weave the surface but um I didn't paint any of it, and I liked that a lot, you know, so it was like my, my vision, my form, but then it was like the, a beautiful metaphor for the community weaving together and creating that work, which was in Montrose, which is, you know, near, near where we are now, yeah. um, you know, the, the heart of the art community here. Yeah, so. it's like a, it's like a big, it's like so beautiful how you like truly democratize art in that way, you know, I think people allowed them to like 
you know, you probably fulfilled something that people have always wanted to do for a long time. And that's, right. like, really dope. Wow, oh, thanks, man. That's, like, really sick. I didn't think of it that way. Um, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, cheers. Uh, Brendan, um, the color of your wood and how you allow the color to be natural, how did you come about that? Like, what, how did that? Yeah, so uh, I love color, um, which I think is great for the show because there's so many great colors in the show. And when I first started, the first sculpture I made was the tree. And if you've never looked for green stain, it's very difficult to find. They don't sell it at home. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I did the tree, and then uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I went on to the wave, and blue stain is equally difficult to find. <laughs> so what I was thinking about was, is there any way to naturally get the colors that I was looking for for my sculptures? Because in those sculptures, there's about 200 cubes in each one of them. I, I had to stain uh, over twice as many to, in order to select the, cr the correct gradient and to get the colors that I wanted out of those. Because the wood takes the stain, even though it's the same kind of wood, it takes it differently in each, in each cube. And so what I was looking for with the colors and what came about with the natural colors and the sawdust and the birds was that I was tired of staining wood. <laughs> and I was wondering if there was anything that nature made that would take that place. And I went on a long rabbit hole, I bought a lot of wood, and um, I found that I could get the colors that I wanted and what I was looking for. And that it was really interesting because now it was natural instead of, you know, the artificial stain. Um, and so the stain still plays part of my work, but just that natural color of the wood and using this organic material in kind of a rigid and, and precise way really was, the contrast really drew me into to using those woods. So that's where the color came. So, yeah, it's like super, like whenever you, at first I was like, man, he's, I was like, how do you find these like green stains? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're like, no, nah, man, like, too. it's <laughs> a natural color. Yeah. I was like, wait. And yeah. again, like you said, you took you down a rabbit, rabbit yeah. hole. Whenever I got home, I like went down a rabbit hole mm -hmm. of like, there's green wood? Like, how does it, you know, nature, super wild. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> 25 varieties of wood in the bird room um, of all the different colors and textures. And there's, I think, 88 or 90 birds in there, and they're all unique. There's not a single repeat of them. So it's just a testament to really what nature can create and the beauty that's back on there. Yeah. So, um, I love the idea of you being an engineer, and then you like kind of made that switch. Yeah. Necessarily, like, to make art. Mm -hmm. Was that something, like, have you always been making art, or were you just like, you know what, I'm going to start doing this? <laughs> Um, so I'm a full-time engineer. I work for a company called Oxy. They have a big billboard in the right field of the Astro Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, with all my other time, I make art. And I think the my work uh, as an engineer, those sensibilities transfer into my work as an artist. So you can see in my work a lot of precision, a lot of straight lines, very precise and accurate measurement. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to incorporate organic ideas. So a lot of my work is inspired by nature, the birds, the trees, the fire, uh, the wood itself. And so I like having this, um, my work is smoothing the messy into the precise. So like that's how I'm processing things uh, and thinking about, you know, difficult stuff or thinking about uh, a memory. You know, a lot of my work is just a snippet of, of the memory. So um, the engineering kind of plays into how I process those and how I, how that work is translated into, into art. Um, but I didn't always make art, but I always made things. Um, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago when I really sat down and put my mind to you know, creating what I had sitting in my brain for so long um, that I started actually making things. So um, it's you know, relatively kind of new thing. Yeah. And I bring up that point because it's important to know that like even if you have a job now, keep making that art, like still express yourself and like still go to that because you never know. You could have a show at a nice gallery eventually, you know? So that's why I bring that up. It's important for yes. everyone to know because there's so many people that feel that like, just because they don't have a degree or whatever, Absolutely. like I can't make art or I don't deserve to make art. Everyone deserves to make art. Yes. And that's important to know. Um, Katie, sorry, okay. Uh, you're at a residency right now and you're working on some huge monumental works. Yes. Um, and they're similar to what you're doing now, but like still different. Can you talk a little bit about those works? So over the years, I've been 
investigating materials and trying to figure out the appropriate visual language to match and communicate through geological features and processes. And this is a culmination of all that, including using my background in geology to reinterpret maps into visual landscapes. So right now I'm working on one of Mexico City um, and everything below that, you know, from this is the rock that builds these monuments that are there and a lot of the architecture. And then the next one's going to be Monterey. And then I'm going to work my way up further into North America of cities that are really important to me. But um, yeah, it's, it's geolog geology is a really big study. It has really big visuals. And I wanted to work on a format that encompasses all of that. Because when we're talking about that length of time, it's much bigger than something that you can put on a canvas like this. You know, you need 11 feet, 12 feet, 20 feet, whatever, to ar fully articulate how massive this amount of time we're talking about is in comparison to the human lifespan, so. Awesome. Um, in the residency you just got, it's, it's here in town, correct? And it, it is. It's a new residency? It's new-ish, yeah. So it's ran by the collector Paula Kreischel, um, who is very well known in the Latin American art scene. Um, however, she wants to marry both uh, her global connections with that with the local connections she has in the local art scene and merge them together in conversation. So right now, I'm the local Houstonian and I'm with another artist from Kyrgyzstan and by proxy, Mexico. And he's, his background's in astronomy, mine's in geology. So our conversations have been <laughs> totally, really interesting and bizarre. Uh, but, yeah. It, that that's super awesome. That yeah, I get. I mean, obviously, she like hard paired y'all together for a reason. Absolutely. Has that changed your vision as far as like whenever you went to whenever you got the residency, you're like, all right, I'm gonna go in and to do this. But now you've had these conversations and like new inspiration has occurred. Has it changed your vision of what you want to accomplish in the residency? Um, not so much because the, what I do is kind of a it's, it's a culmination of daily practice and thousands of tiny movements that go into a larger thing at the end of it. So it's like I already have planned rituals around making these pieces. Um, what it's doing is shaping the conceptual aspects I have around this and really expanding how far I can go with it. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, we're delving into the depths of chaos. It's cool. Yeah, it's yeah, fun. absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ali, yeah. your work, um, you were talking about going on your travels and taking photos and then using those photos to embellish and create like newer work using those photos. I relate because I do the same thing with my work. Um, what, I guess like, what led you to that? Like how did you figure out like this is what you wanted to, how, I guess like because people take photos of things and like that's it. Right. But like, what how, what led you to that next step? I guess the photos are a starting point because my intention is to connect with the energy of the space. So my travels were prompted when I chose to leave New York and I've been living there for a decade and in that really man-made environment. Like, mm. And then to like travel to Ireland, I saw the landscape there and I was like, wait, <laughs> this is where I need to be. Like, this is where the magic happens. So going into those spaces, I'm using photos and my adventures throughout there to um, like I do journal entries after I take photos and um, and then I'll go back to the studio and use all this input and do sketches and then create these monotypes to really kind of join my inner world with the outer landscape that I'm experiencing. So it's a way to kind of combine those two to create this other world. Awesome. The the monotype technique you use is so interesting. It's like so unique. Like without giving too much of your secret <laughs> what like how did you like how did you come across that process like yeah. what well i used to do ballpoint pen drawings and do circles to build up these like masses of formals and they were just very time intensive so it was getting kind of controlled and so to get out of that i chose monotype as a way to kind of loosen up and allow an unknown to enter my process so with the monotype technique i'll have like a normally you have like a plexiglass sheet i use this gel plate which has been really great and transfers total range of tone. And then I'll paint on the plate and then just kind of see where it gets to where I want it. And then I'll transfer it. 
So the image I get is mere image of my attention, and it adds all these other unknowns in the process, the way the ink meshes or disappears. So kind of a ghostly image appears, and I just like working with that. Awesome. Delete the videos. I don't know who's recording. <laughs> <laughs> delete the video. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vaughn. This is like very interesting. Rachel, last but not least. Um, Hello. <laughs> how did you come to select fabric art as a process slash medium for a vehicle of expression? Well, that was really interesting. Um, I chose to get into fibers when I was pregnant with my son, whose birthday it is today. So Woo! happy birthday! Happy birthday, 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 birthday. Ball. <laughs> um, I couldn't work with my enamel paints anymore because of the fumes. So I had to be really careful during my pregnancy. And um, I came from a background of drawing and my tummy was just too big. I couldn't really sit comfortably at my drawing table and draw. So I started doing weavings. And from the weavings, I went to punch needling. And from punch needling, I went to tufting. And tufting is really where I found my voice. And I was really able to express my feelings throughout um, the tufting process, which has been really great. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, how has working in fabric as a medium inspired, has it inspired you to work in like other mediums or now you're like? I love experimenting in the fibers medium. So I love trying out different ways to use fiber art to um, accomplish what I want to say. So I'll either be tufting or I'll be punch needling or weaving or embroidering and um, I really take inspiration from the traditional aspect of women's work that's kind of what I wanted to connect to when I was pregnant I was like all right I need something that's that's um, embodying the femininity that I'm feeling right now because I never felt more feminine than when I was like you know I was pregnant with my son of yeah. course you know so it was um it was getting to that point and um, exploring with that medium and working in fibers has really made me think about other mediums too, like going towards sculpture side or like covering um, chairs or some like other pieces of furniture with tufted pieces of fabric, you know, I've been thinking about all of those things and it's really interesting. Um, what I can do with the medium and what I could do with the medium. So I think about it often, other things that I could be doing other than tapestries, but I really love doing the tapestries right now, so I think I'm gonna be sticking to it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Well, that's it for my questions. If the, anyone in the audience has any questions or anything they would like to ask, feel free. That's it. I guess that means I have some pretty good questions. Anyways, <laughs> thank you guys so much again for coming out. Um, thank yeah, you again thank to Sarah Fultz. Thank you Fultz for being here today. Uh, we'll stay through the next hour or so with the artists. If you have any individual questions for them, you now know who to find and, and ask. Um, we've got some beverages up front. If you have any questions or something that you just have to take home with you, come please find myself or Laura Bledsoe, who's our gallery director. Um, and thank you so much for being here. We're, oh, we're honored to work with you guys. Oh, you got one funny one. All right, so I like the, uh, the reflection process. So after doing the show with Fultz, for any one of you that might want to talk about it, um, after putting the work out and having the reception and producing these pieces, right, is there anything in terms of your own self-reflection that maybe you're going to put out in the atmosphere or try differently or like any of it? That's you know, a good question. Like is there a new form? Is there a new, you know? Like you want to put stuff on the ceiling because I mean <laughs> we're activating different spaces. We got a lot of color, a lot of texture. You know, is there any like just wild like, iron you want to put in the fire? Any anybody? You know. Like. <laughs> I'd like to make larger paper pieces. Um, being that I'm going larger with the painting already, why not go larger with paper pieces? Absolutely. Yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. I've been going larger with my textiles, so. <laughs> um, having them larger in this space has really inspired me to make more larger work, so I've been doing more portals at my house right now, <laughs> in my studio. 
I think for me, I've really enjoyed being in conversation with these other artists and seeing how all of our work plays off of each other and comes together. And that has been something really new and interesting for me. So um, maybe working with other artists or collaborating or something like that would be an, an interesting idea. Um, but it's been really nice to be amongst this group. And before we go, I forgot, I'm supposed to say some things about Adrian's work. Um, Adrian Landon Brooks. I've known Adrian since I was 17 years old. Uh, without meeting him, I don't think I'd be sitting in this stool, like 100%. Um, I met him at a really, uh, I met him when I was like really young and like really trying to find like who I was as an artist. Am I, can I be an artist, whatever this is. And he was already drawing. He had been a graffiti artist for a long time. Um, he like very prolific graffiti artist. Um, and then to get to see his sketchbook was just mind blowing. And then for him to like spend time with me, even though he was like, whatever, you know, he was like a normal guy like I was, but I emulated him because his drawings were so great. Um, and so him being a graffiti artist and them using so many characters, that's why he used the characters that he uses in his work. It's like this weird, not weird. It's a interesting transition from making graffiti to being a fine artist and how you pull these elements from the street to make it more palatable, so to speak for the fine art world and for people to actually receive it more because once, you, once you're able to create an image that people can really relate to and have like a nostalgia based love for, then like their brain like explodes, you know? Um, so meeting Adrian and talking with him and making art with him at House of Pies was just like very formidable for me to become the artist that I am today. So I just, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I forgot to say some words about his work, but yeah, that that guy like really makes some really interesting work. So I highly suggest you take a look at it. His his he makes all that work with a micron pen. So it's his detail is just really really insane. So anyways, yeah. Thank you guys again. And we've got artists uh, brief interviews uh, videos. If you want to check out any of them, we'll have the volume on playing over in the corner. Otherwise, please help yourself to refreshments. Take a look around and let us know if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks.